still Shivani to connect you. I've asked Shivani to immediately give them a call. So, sure, ma'am. Uh, so, while we are at it, let me uh, get a quick start here. Okay. Good evening, everyone, and a very warm and hearty welcome to our uh, fifth edition of uh, the Wheat Related Disorders webinar. This one is titled Wheat Related Disorders and Mental Health. Now, mental health has become an area of concern, especially over the last few years. Uh, post the COVID pandemic, it has become something of note that everybody pays attention to. You know, there was a 2017 study conducted uh, and it estimated that 792 million people lived with a mental health disorder. Given our population of having just crossed over 8 billion, that is slightly more than 1 in 10 people globally, right? And uh, mental health disorders are complex and can take many forms. They also remain widely underreported. So it gives us in, uh, immense hope that we hope to bring these ideas to you today uh, in partnership with uh, the Celiac Society of India, Know We Well, and our esteemed panelists here. A very warm and hearty welcome to all here. I'd like to now uh, invite Ms. Uh, Anju Khosla to give a short uh, intro slash brief on the work and activities done by the Celiac Society of India. Anju Bam, over to you. Thank you, Arjun. On behalf of the Celiac Society of India, a very warm welcome to all. The Celiac Society of India was founded in 2006, and our mission is to bring wheat sensitivity to mainstream dialogue with the aim of optimizing health. The Celiac Society undertakes various activities to generate awareness about wheat-related disorders, its early diagnosis and management. Many of you may have attended the webinars that we have put together in the last two years. But for those who have not, please visit our website, celiacsocietyofindia.com to view the recordings. We also publish a quarterly newsletter called Wheat Views. And those interested in receiving a copy may please drop their name and number in the chat. Before handing over to Dr. Dang, we'd like to play a short recording on one of our patients who describes her journey in handling depression and how she witnessed a turnaround by going on a gluten-free diet. From being a topper in school to being ostracized as being a mad child, uh, Nikita tells us how she benefited by the by going on a special diet. Uh, thank you, everyone. And um, sorry, I think I need to hand it over to Dr. Tom to tell us a little bit about uh, Know We Well after the clipping finishes. Thank you. Volume. There is no volume. Sorry about that. And I'm Nikita Jain, and I want to share something with you from the journey of depression to now the journey of happiness. So I was an epileptic patient since a long time. It's been almost 14 years I was surviving that issue. And we lost all the hopes in here back because I was told by my doctors to get myself into a rehabilitation center so that they could tie me up and get me into the state of normal condition. But 
my parents weren't so excited about that and they didn't want me to treat like that so we visited every high profile doctors in india from aims to president physician also they put me on depressing drugs phenylalanine and what not all but uh, my parents were so unhappy and so stressful because of the situation i was facing i could not study i could not get my degree bachelor's of science which i have got now because we found out the doctor ishi khosla when we visited kerala and my mom saw her interview and read, went through all of her achievements and great things and after that she suddenly contacted her and we came here to the doctor and she diagnosed my problems got my all the medical blood report then she found that i was not put on a good drugs i was even getting worse my condition was not going to improve by those drugs so she put me on some good supplements a good free diet which worked for me like heaven that was a major bomb for me the gluten free diet i stopped eating wheat and things related to wheat like corn sooji etc etc and within a while, within a month or two we could see the difference in me and it's been less than a year now and i'm a happy person enjoying my life a lot and do not want to remember though that dark hole because i am living in the sunshine now and my parents my family even the doctor i everybody is so happy and grateful touch well that was indeed a heartwarming story and uh, you know take us forward i mm. upon dr tom o'brien the chief health officer for uh, novibel dr tom over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much and I will talk a little bit about Noe well. I just want to say for this lovely young lady who just sat in front of a camera, she's not a professional actress and I'm sure she was quite nervous in doing this, but she wanted to tell the story that she has her life back and it was because of a wheat sensitivity. Not every patient with epilepsy has a wheat sensitivity but if they do nothing else will stop the progression of the disease other than identifying it so just keep that in mind with that lovely story her trying to share with us know we well is an organization that began a little over 3 years ago officially and it is a website where people have access to the most comprehensive information about regenerating your health the founder her name is kimberly whittle she is a friend of mine i met her when she told me about her project and she is a brilliant woman who has taken cutting edge technology and put it together on a platform so that everyone has access to the very best information available the doctors who want to be listed in no we well and we now have some doctors in india who are joining the team from all over the world from england and france they are vetted first no one is allowed to have access to post information on no we well until we have confirmed there there is no legal action against them that they they are genuine and they are educated people experienced uh people who are at the top of their field so we recommend that everyone go to know we well just to explore a little bit and see there are different levels of membership and different services available the introductory level is no charge whatsoever so you can see if this is something that you resonate with and you would like to gather more information from this website thank thank you for the opportunity to speak on that Thank you Dr Tom. I'd like to now call upon our moderator and host for the evening Dr Arjun Dang. Dr Dang, the forum is yours. Hi, hi. Thank you. Thank you Arjun and a very warm welcome. I think this is the first time that we have uh, so many esteemed panelists and super excited for today and also today's topic is extremely intriguing and relevant also to today's time. and also i think i'll i'll quote what dr tom was saying i think uh, in the last webinar and that 
these days there are researchers who actually call our gut as the second brain and that is why understanding the crosstalk or the communication between what's really happening in the gut and how it's influencing what the brain is doing or in other words what we call as mental health is very important and also i was i was reading up that why is it that the gut is called the second brain for all our viewers today and essentially the entire digestive tract from your food pipe that we call the esophagus to your anus that is the end point of your digestive tract it is lined by nerves and neurons and neurotransmitters that is very similar to how your central nervous system that is your brain functions and also that is why it is called as the second brain and also how the microbiome that is the good bacteria in your gut affects the inflammation in your entire body and in hand also affects how your mental health is now um, obviously without wasting much more time i'm quickly going to jump to dr tom and this is something that i i want to actually understand from you and the way you explain i'm a big fan but if you could just explain to us a little bit about this gut brain axis of which i've told very basics that i that i am aware of and tell everyone today and also set the stage for the uh, conversation coming up that would be great thank you dr dang some people have heard about the importance of the gut and the inside of the gut one teaspoon one teaspoon of poop has more bacteria than all the stars in the known universe and that is not an exaggeration that means that in the 20 25 feet of our gut there are billions and billions and billions of bacteria why is that important the bacteria when you exercise to get stronger muscles and if your muscles are sore the next day it's because of lactic acid you have made the exhaust of your muscle cells from working so hard you have extra lactic acid it makes your muscles sore for a day or two the bacteria in your gut have exhaust all of these billions and billions of bacteria have exhaust it's called the metabolites of the microbiome and that exhaust makes up 36% of all of the small molecules in your blood are the exhaust of the bacteria in your gut why because the exhaust of the bacteria in the gut are the messengers that travel in the bloodstream your bloodstream is just a highway and it's got a lot of traffic all going in the same direction but it's just a highway and more than 1/3 of all of the traffic on the highway is the exhaust of the bacteria in the gut what that means is that these messengers are being carried through your entire body and it was dr michael gershon at princeton that wrote the book the second brain back in 1999 and he showed us back then that for every one message from the brain going down telling the gut what to do there are nine messages from the gut going up telling the brain what to do and the basic mechanism of that is the exhaust of the bacteria these messengers they get in the bloodstream and they go everywhere they tell your heart how fast to beat and how often to beat they tell your lungs how to breathe they tell your liver how to detox chemicals they tell your brain how to make brain hormones called neurotransmitters and that's our topic today is about the brain and how the gut has so much control the gut has its hands on the steering wheel of how your brain functions and if you turn your steering wheel just a little bit in 50 yards you're off the road so when your gut is out of balance and some of the messengers are from the bad bacteria in your gut they create inflammation in your brain and they knock your brain hormones out of balance it's much more technical than that but that i hope gives us a basic understanding 
of why the gut is so important with any brain condition, whether it's epilepsy or depression or anxiety or Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, it doesn't matter that you always have to include building a healthier microbiome when you're dealing with problems in the brain. Thank you, Dr. Dang. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tom. Again, very, very nicely and clearly explained. And quickly, I'll, I'll go on to our other panelists and Dr. Shukla. We have Dr. Shukla here. And uh, Dr. Shukla is, is, again, a stalwart in the field of in, internal medicine. And I will also ask Sir to give us a brief about his journey, about how he started purely as allopathic doctor. And earlier, he was with Artemis, now with Max, and heading very senior positions. And he's seen, I would say, hundreds of thousands of patients over the pandemic and even before that and even right now. And now he runs one of the most sought after integrative medicine clinics in Delhi NCR and in the country where they have a very holistic approach to any kind of chronic illness that a patient presents with. So Dr. Shukla, a very, very warm welcome, sir. And thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Dang. And, and thank and, you, and, Dr. Dang. And uh, thank you, Ishi, for inviting me to this session. Um, uh, so Great. it's a very interesting topic today. And uh, just to add to what Dr. Tom just said, uh, our brain, the brain and the spinal cord has various kinds of neurotransmitters and chemicals known as dopamine, serotonin, acetylcholine. And in most people who have depression, the serotonin levels are remarkably low. Uh, they are deficient in serotonin. And... Uh, it is the serotonin, which is the main chemical, which is responsible for the gut brain axis. And uh, you'll be surprised to know that 90% of the serotonin receptors are in the gut, actually. So uh, it, is, it is the gut, which is actually controlling so many of your neurotransmitters, which are actually determining the autonomic nervous system. And autonomic nervous system is something which is not under our voluntary control. So the peristaltic movement of the intestine, the gut flora, everything is being controlled by these chemicals. So uh, it, it's, it's very interesting to talk about uh, the gut flora and how it impacts mental health. That's, that's great to know, sir. And uh, sir, I would like to also ask you um, the prevalence of these mental health issues. We've seen that there's been a rampant surge in, in, the, uh, in the mental health issues and also post the pandemic. We are seeing, so I wonder sometimes because of stress or is it because of uh, the COVID infection itself, maybe the vaccination? So do you have um, any thoughts on this? Why would the incidence be increasing as such? Uh, yes, Arjun, you are right. The prevalence of mental health issues is on the rise. Uh, in fact, a recent study published in December 2020, which was done on 10,000 Indians, found that 74% of these Indians were suffering from stress, while 88% were suffering from anxiety. And the data also showed that nearly 70% uh, stress therapists documented an increase in the number of patients uh, that visited their clinics. And 55% said that there have been an increase in the first-time clients after COVID-19 pandemic. And in personal experience, in my OPD, 75 to 90% of the patients who come to my OPD have a stress-related illness. So it is definitely on the rise. In fact, uh, there's another global study where 41,000 professionals in 13 countries were studied by Oracle, and they found that Indians specifically had higher stress levels at their workplace, 91%, in fact, compared to 80% globally. So there is absolutely, you are right, Arjun, there is a link between the COVID-19 pandemic, which has been going on for the last two, three years, which has changed the world altogether. And uh, I, I feel it is, you know, probably related to the sustained elevated stress levels, which have resulted in, you know, increased anxiety, depression, even suicides. And um, a certain, certain amount of stress is definitely important for us to perform better. But elevated, sustained stress levels for a prolonged period of time is the problem. That's, that's when the problem actually starts. 
So uh, over the last two, three years, you know, uh, there have been various reasons why uh, mental health issues have gone up. You know, uh, not only environmental reasons, also these, that the fact that, you know, sustained chronic stress levels also change the, our genetic makeup. You know, the, chrome, the expression of chromosomes also changes over a period of time. So that also may be responsible. So there are various reasons why mental health issues have gone up. Great. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for that. And that's that's very clear. And I couldn't agree with you more that even in, in my practice, I've been seeing a lot of people and even for the matter of fact, adolescents coming up with this excessive stress and with this inhibition of not being able to go out and interact with people. And, and I think all that has certainly affected the entire generation that's gone through the pandemic. So quickly coming to Dr. Deepak Gupta also. Hi, sir. Hi. And it's and it's 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 really nice to interact with you and also have you on this uh, panel discussion. And um, sir, actually, um, Dr. Shukta was speaking about neurotransmitters. And um, essentially, neurotransmitters are chemical substances which are released at the end of a nerve fiber on the arrival of a nerve impulse and lead to the transfer of the impulse to another nerve fiber muscle or any other structure. But essentially, neurotransmitters obviously play a very important role in mental health. So uh, like the way Dr. Tom and then Dr. Shukla explained about the gut-brain axis, could you also add to that and also tell our audience a little bit about the function and the physiology behind this entire uh, entire physiology? See, um, um, see, the main thing is that as the gut-brain axis is altered, as the microbiota is altered, and with alteration of microbiota because of multiple factors, whether it's a diet, whether it's uh, uh, the stress levels, whether it's uh, various other factors, which is altering the gut, my, uh, gut uh, uh, microbiota and leading to further, or leading to further to, you know, all those chemicals entering the bloodstream and leading to neural inflammation and then altering the, the neurochemistry of the brain. That is where, that is where the, depression and mental health disorder comes. In the end, if you see the mental health disorders, uh, the neurobiological theory, it is that the, the dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonins, they are altered. So all the antidepressants are either to uptake, increase uptake of serotonin or increase uptake of dopamine. That's where they work on. Sorry, that's where. So anything, so that is the end product. So you are altering the dopamine and uh, serotonin are altered. You give a medication and they try to enhance that. And then the depression elevates in some of them. But why is that happening? That is behind that. So the neuroinflammation, which is altering the neural circuits, why neural inflammation is happening? Because of, as Dr. Tom was talking about, you know, that one is to nine thing happening. One from the brain, but nine from the gut. And then the deficit and the bacterial deficit going into the bloodstream. And why is that happening? Because of the, the gut. The gut is altered. The microbiota is altered. Why is that happening? Because of the what we are eating, what we are taking, what we are taking inside. All those things are there. And as we know, the gut is the second brain. That's why. And we have a lot of serotonin in the gut. And that's, that's the thing. So that is where it comes up. So what is entering into the brain, gut, is a very, very key, key important factor. And one more thing is that, why you're asking is that, you know, is that why, why COVID gave such a big rise? See, mental health was already on the rise before COVID also. Mental health issues, mental health problems already on the rise before COVID. But in COVID, it, it got a almost like to the steep increase. And the WHO study which came in 2022 March clearly said there's a 25% further increase in mental health issues. Now, what, what also could have happened in the in this COVID time, the people had a sed more sedentary lifestyle, more work from more work from home. Hello. Yeah. So people, there was a disturbance. That's why I stopped. Sorry. So people, yeah. In the COVID time, one of the reasons which I speculate could be that the sedentary lifestyle, work from home altered sleep patterns and increase food stuff, preservative processed and junk food 
which went into lot of because i work with children dollars and i don't work with, i don't work with adults i work with less than 20 population so i can say from that perspective so altered food habits and also the exercise thing reduced so decrease exercise altered food habits altered sleep habit patterns along this all stress all that sedentary lifestyle altered the gut to more alter the gut pat, gut gut microbiota to more so to more extent this is my speculation i need to see this is whether it it sounds true or not and that also could have added to the further increase in mental health issues absolutely absolutely dr gupta i completely agree with that and uh, even if even if food is probably the fuel on the fire and there is an existing etiology i think it's extremely crucial to what is going inside the gut and quickly i'll uh, go on to dr divya also hi 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 ma'am how are you hi i'm good thank you it's 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 very very nice to have you here today with all of us and i was i was speaking to ishi ma'am earlier as well and she was giving a brief background about you and we'd love to hear about your point of view on the relation of diet with mental health issues and although there is significant literature and what uh, dr tom and dr shukla and dr gupta were also mentioning that there is a lot of literature but in your clinical practice have you ever felt like there is a barrier or a challenge when you actually have to implement it with patients and any experiences that you would love to enlighten us with so um so i of, i of course feel having been on a gluten free diet myself i think for the last 6 8 years i felt the um, the shifts that i've noticed myself um, and of course clients ask me you know how do you wake up at 4:30 5 in the morning go for runs carry through the work day and you seem like you're like an energizing energizer bunny that was never the case before i went off uh, gluten so that becomes a good point for me to introduce the things that i use uh, that help me so for instance i'll say the purpose of life that fuels me uh, the the movement that i do the activity i do um, you know stress <laughs> management and of course a big one being um, what i eat so that becomes a focal point and that kind of becomes a nice segue into uh, what i tend to look at as lifestyle education that let's talk about this as as part of your process of recovery from any a mental health disturbance it's never easy and i'll tell you why dr dang because the challenges are so many so there are so many myths that exist around a gluten free diet or uh, you know so it's like it's a fad it's something that we are lately seeing that people are using to lose weight so that becomes one uh, the second one is uh, you know um, there's no scientific claim to it uh, there's psychotherapy there's psychotropic medications that work how did this suddenly come into the picture um what is life without a typical wheat roti pizza burger especially when we are looking at clients who are also using those as comfort food so it's almost like you're telling them to kind of uh, start looking at an altered lifestyle now those are some challenges but the bigger ones i feel one is when somebody is depressed or when they're anxious they're already feeling such a strong sense of inertia and an inability to even want to do things when you're suggesting something like shifting their diet pattern for them it seems like oh my god you're asking me way too much to do so again it needs to be dealt with very sensitively in terms of you know suddenly you're asking them to revamp what what they're eating and that like for them even getting up bathing dressing is a challenge and now you're suggesting something like this along with that comes a lot of concerns around um how will i answer what will i tell people like there's a fear of literally being socially rejected or ostracized they become the focus of oh you can't do this you can't eat this why not why this why that so when they're anyway struggling with a mental health issue to suddenly be in the limelight and answering all these questions becomes another big fear factor for them the other one i've noticed a lot that tends to happen is i've been fine all these years you know i've been eating wheat since i was a kid why would it suddenly be an issue now and that's a that's a valid point so then you kind of get into the whole educating them about all of that the bigger one i found and i i, I mean i i don't want to obviously go over time but there's a case that i do want to talk about where this woman came with very severe anxiety symptoms and whenever somebody presents to me with severe anxiety or an irritable bowel syndrome i know something is happening at the gut level So I said, you know, I, I it's something that you're eating. I would like you to meet my nutritionist because I would give her my example. 
and she was of course very resistant um you know she was she uh, went and spoke to her primary care physician that you know i was talking to my psychologist and she was suggesting uh, going on a gluten free diet he of course said oh it's a fad you know you don't need to listen to her so there again you know we're dealing with an with an aspect where whatever suggestions we may be making coming from a scientific point of view is rejected dr dang it reached such a stage that she lost about 20 kilos she was to the point of being anorexic she was put on psychotropic medications it was only when she was admitted in the hospital for uncontrollable diarrhea and all of that is when she finally agreed to speak to a nutritionist and they said listen you need to get off gluten the remarkable recovery that followed was telling in itself she was back to a healthy weight her panic attacks went her insomnia went away her mood was fine she came back to just being like like nothing had happened and so for me i think the challenge we also face one i'm sure dr bhavna will also empathize with me that anyway a lot of people look at us as oh you're non medical doctors you know you only talk you do talk therapy so you don't give medicine so we're anyways faced with the challenge where we are also now dealing with some mental health practitioners i wish there was a more openness and awareness that okay if you're suggesting an integrated approach to saying consult an internal medicine doctor or a nutritionist i wish people would receive those inputs because often times and i'm noticing more than ever that for mental health uh, issues or any physical ailment you have to have a holistic integrated approach so so those are some challenges uh, but you know we keep forging ahead and trying to make a difference right there but things hopefully will change as we go along <laughs> absolutely so so dr divya very relevant and i can also relate with that and during the pandemic especially there was so much chaos especially in the city of delhi and uh, with the labs being in the forefront i i can't even start telling you how much stress, stress there was on the lab also and i also felt during that time that the diet that i was eating and especially those days when i used to have a heavy dinner and then sleep the next day i used to feel sluggish so although not very specific but i completely agree with you and it's very important to stay focused on what we are actually eating so quickly coming to you dr bhavna it's so nice to have you with us and uh, i would like you to also add to the similar topic that dr divya was speaking about and also could you enlighten us a little bit about nutritional psychology and what it really is and in your experience have you come across any such cases or any anecdotes that all of us can learn from uh, thank you dr dang for inviting me and i must start by actually congratulating uh, now noel and csi for choosing such a wonderful topic that we all should be cognizant of and i think dr dang you brought up a new science in today which is nutritional psychology i think it is the beginning as dr tom said that dr shukla validated along with dr gupta that uh, the gut brain access is truly being studied and i don't think uh, across the world there is something like nutritional psychology but i think leaders with authority should start something like nutritional psychology because i do agree with dr divya where she shared a lot of the limitations that she mentioned we face in psychotherapy but you know the silver lining is and especially we all realized during the covid that an integrated holistic approach has become in demand in times of today and i think it is time to capitalize because when i started my thought process on nutritional psychology quote unquote was with my own family with was with my own daughter who is currently just finished her mbbs in mumbai and planning to go further for her academics to uh, uk or us and that is when being from the medical fraternity she realized that all the allopathic treatments for her eczemas and skin concerns and allergies were just not getting handled till the magical <coughs> ishi kosla's remedies came into play which were purely related to the gut and how the gut not only helped her with her what would you say elimination of many physical health and skin health concerns but also enabled her to get a more confident mental health to be able to reach where she's reached in times of today so that is where about 
eight years ago, my entire scientific thought process on nutritional psychology came about from the house and yet to deliver it to clients. It took me till today. Till today means when the concept and the topic was conceptualized because till then I was facing these concerns that Dr. Divya mentioned very, very simply. That one, I did not feel expertized enough to be able to guide, so I would refer. Yet, I think only 10% of the people I referred actually reached a nutritionist to deal with their mental health concerns. Yes, they would reach nutritionists. And I would actually say you're going and meeting a clinical nutritionist, whichever part of the world or the country or the, or the city of Delhi I was in. And as, I mean, if they did reach, very good for them because we got good results and I took some credit of it on psychotherapy. But yes, it was a credit that was a joint integrated effort. But I think the 90% who didn't reach, we come with that same challenge that Dr. Divya was mentioning that one, they're already going through the concern of mental health, which is extremely stigmatic even in urban metro India. And then we add on nutritional constraints to them. Actually limits us in our own fields this fact I, that the gut brain access is so powerful look after yourself holistically thank you thank you dr bhavna we lost you for a second in the middle but i think the message is loud and clear and that the gut brain access is indispensable to understand and also then apply in the clinical field whenever you are looking at patients and the second thing i completely agree with you is that Many times I've heard the word magic and Ishi Tosla in the same sentence. So I completely agree with you on that. Quickly moving on to Ishi ma'am also. And my next question is to you. And uh, ma'am, a lot has been said. And um, a lot of our experts also have commented on the connection between the gut and the brain. But I'd like to hear it in your words. That what is the actual connection or the relationship between nutrition and mental health? And also we heard the word inflammation a lot these days. And is it the inflammation in the gut that translates to inflammation in the brain and to that wide spectrum of mental health issues? Or is there something else that we are missing, ma'am? Thank you, Arjun. And um, I'd really like to reiterate the fact that whatever we are discussing today is hugely important as the burden of mental health and depression are really overtaking us faster than we ever imagined. The WHO has in fact uh, said that depression will be the next big thing, health, uh, next big health burden by 2030. And, um, you know, the pandemic hasn't really helped. Um, so a lot has already been said about this, but let me first confess that uh, when we, as a nutritionist and as a you know, young practitioner, I never really thought that I would be able to uh, manage patients with mental health issues uh, through diet. It was really, and till today, let me be very clear that I don't think I remember a single patient of mine, uh, barring maybe a few exceptions, who have come primarily to me to fix their mood or their, their mental health issues. They always come with the baggage of other problems which are uh, more obvious and in the face nutritionally related, which could be their weight, it could be uh, diabetes, it could be skin problems, et cetera. But primarily they come for other reasons. And when we fix this part of it by default, that's when the connection is completely compelling and that's why I think it is so important to you know, address this and uh, to delve, delve into the deeper aspects and the science around it, which is today, I think, in the last decade, is so, so much out there. There is so much research and Dr. Tom has already shared so much. And you know, really, it, you, every clinical practitioner today and every listening audience here must read about these connections. They are there, but they are really not in practice. And so um, coming back to uh, this issue, what is more or uh, even of uh, you know, greater concern to me is when young children 
Really, when I'm talking of 10-year-olds being put on antidepressants or drugs for ADHD or anxiety, it really, really bothers me. And because today I know I have the tools to fix it through the diet. And the and nothing is more profound. As a nutritionist, as the science goes, we all know that you know there are nutrients. We have the B vitamins, we have the B12, and we have magnesium, and we have uh, the omega-3s and we have zinc and uh, all of those in our toolbox, but nothing has really contributed the way, uh, you know, in uh, in transforming people's life, lives uh, compared to what we do with the elimination diets and when we address the gut and the gut microbiome. That has been really a game changer. And when we put all that together, and like Bhavna and everyone is talking about an uh, integrated, a uh, holistic approach, it is absolutely necessary to bring it out in the open. And I have so many patients who have got rid of their drugs, who have been told by their, their physicians and psychiatrists that these are lifelong and you can never get off them. And within a few months of being on the diet, they are off their drugs. And now it's not only just months, it's been years when people have lived with these uh, drug-free uh, lifestyles and, and are following it and are happy. You saw the first one of the cases we started with. And, um, you know, it's it's really something which I'm not over-exaggerating. And yet I must emphasize the fact that... Um, you know, drug therapy has its place and everybody cannot be put off drugs. But certainly if the pill burden can go down, if the drugs can be reduced and in conjunction, we have, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the diet which is initiated. And of course, the other lifestyle measures, which include yoga, meditation, and uh, so many other modalities which are available today. I think we are in a very good place to deal with mental health issues. And um, to your question, Arjun, about uh, the the inflammation that really is something which is the, um, the 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 mechanism by which all of this happens. So we have a, in the gut, like Dr. Tom said, the steering wheel. We have I call it the control panel, the microbiome, which is really controlling all the neurotransmitters and the uptake of nutrition and nutrients in the in the system. So they really are holding our um, our lives. Uh, and they can hold it to ransom if we don't treat them well. So we, we've got to pamper them. We've got to feed them what they like and remove what they don't like and understand that science. Uh, and in my um, in my practice, uh, gluten and uh, certain other grains and uh, excessive amounts of sugar and preserved foods, etc., are some of the key culprits. And insufficient amounts of good fats and uh, fiber, etc., and prebiotics and probiotics are, uh, you know, are, are important. Uh, but what happens with all of this when there is a imbalance in the gut microbiome, when we do not have enough nutrients and the good, the desirable constituents, what happens is a state of inflammation. That's what we call the fire. And in the, you know, inflammation in the gut leads to the is inflammation in the system. It's called systemic inflammation. And it's then since we've already established the gut brain axis, it, it reaches the brain as well. And so if then, and we've also said that the gut is a second brain. So there is inflammation in this brain and the, the other brain. So you can imagine then we are really in a, in a state where we can trigger any of the uh, conditions, uh, mental health issues, which are um, coded in our DNA, which are in our blueprint. So we can see, you know, whether it's uh, depression, whether it's anxiety, panic, bipolar, OCDs, et cetera, et cetera. Whatever your vulnerabilities are, we see that happening. So um, I think um, that's where I leave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Very, very interesting. And uh, so I was actually uh, reading and I came across this and obviously Dr. Tom can also confirm for me because my next question to you uh, is to you, Dr. Tom. I was reading that whenever someone is in a stressful situation, automatically the brain guides the gut to slow down digestion so that maximum energy can be diverted to handling that stressful situation. I was quite intrigued and very flabbergasted to know this fact. And, and then there were a few other examples also of the same. And uh, my, my next question to you, Dr. Tom, would be that we are speaking about the prevalence of this mental health, how it's just surged and post the pandemic also. It's increasing continuously. But I think to, to actually 
control the disease burden of anything even mental health it's more important to actually try and prevent the disease from happening in the first place so any any general tips or any views for our entire audience today on how to prevent mental health illness mental illness and also try and curb it with the nutrition that you are taking that's a very important question thank you so much and in general principles in general what is so critically important is to identify the fuel on the fire where is my inflammation coming from 14 of the 15 top causes of death in the world today according to the world health organization are chronic inflammatory diseases it's inflammation that day after week after month after year this little bit of systemic inflammation going through our entire body it wears us down it wears us down so if we are focusing on how can i reduce the inflammation of your fork what you're putting in your mouth is the most common source there are others but that is the big one and today's topic and this entire series is the most common food that causes that is wheat and it occurs in every individual whether you've crossed the line and you've been diagnosed with celiac disease, which is the end stage. It's like having a heart attack. No one gets a heart attack with a perfectly functioning cardiovascular system. There has to be a problem building up for a long time. No one gets diagnosed with celiac disease out of the blue. There had to have been a problem for a long time they've been living with. And now we know the science is very clear you don't have to have celiac disease for wheat to be the problem. And I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to show you a case study that is similar to the 14, um, to the young girl with epilepsy that we saw the video to begin with. I'm going to share my screen now, if I can. Uh, let's see here. Oh, unfortunately, my computer is not letting me share my screen. So um, I'll wait a few moments and see if my computer wants to be nice. I don't know why it's not doing, but it's not doing it. So I, I, I can't share this screen with you at the moment. Uh, I will try again. Uh, but the message is, how do we reduce the inflammation? And there's two basic concepts we recommend to everyone. The first is the rainbow diet the colors of the rainbow, the fruits and vegetables, the colors that make up the red in tomatoes or the blue in blueberries or the orange in sweet potatoes. Those colors are called polyphenols and they are fire extinguishers in our body. They help to put the fire out. So, eating more fruits and vegetables, less carbohydrates, less pasta, less bread, and just in general, whether it's gluten-free or not, less of those carbohydrates, more fruits and vegetables moves our body in the direction of less inflammation. And every brain dysfunction, whether it's depression or anxiety or bipolar or schizophrenia, or seizures, or Parkinson's, or Alzheimer's. Every single one of them is an inflammatory condition. There's inflammation in the brain. So if we just begin by thinking about reducing the inflammation, we will have gone a long way to slowing down the progression of our problem and eventually putting a stop. The scientists call it arresting the development of chronic inflammatory diseases. 
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tom. And very interesting again. And talking about prevention and talking about diet, I think a very important uh, subject is also supplements. Because these days I see that a lot of people are taking supplements. And even after the pandemic, like that day, there was a patient who was saying that, sir, I've been having zinc and magnesium and I can't get COVID. So so I think that that kind of awareness also is lacking. And I think I, I would request Dr. Shukla, <laughs> since he's here, to explain to us, what do you think or which are the supplements that you suggest and uh, more relevant to this topic as well? And along with supplements, also any other practices while we talk about holistic uh, care for an individual dealing with mental health issues? Yeah, Arjun, you're right. Uh, there has been uh, a surge of supplements over the rack in the market and people are going overboard buying these supplements. Uh, but uh, in my OPD, whenever a patient comes with any illness which is suggestive of a mental illness, first and foremost, uh, what I do is I get a complete blood profile done, including all the vitamin levels, thyroid levels, etc., even the magnesium levels. And uh, so many times we found uh, that correcting these values uh, itself uh, goes a long way and uh, you really don't need supplements generically. So supplements are needed only in those situations where your body is not absorbing uh, adequate vitamins. And, uh, if you are having a good nutritious diet and you have, we are consulting a nutritionist, you don't uh, need to be going overboard with taking supplements. Uh, but it is if, if you suppose you consume alcohol on a regular basis or if you are above 50 and your ability to absorb the nutrients from your diet are poor, I would suggest you go in and get your complete blood profile checked and then uh, consult your physician and then decide which nutrients are actually needed. Uh, plus, uh, uh, I also recommend to my patients to get a Genova a test a GDX uh, comprehensive panel done, which uh, tells you, you know, the complete profile as to the gut microbiome levels, the stool profile, the blood profile. It's uh, very, very informative. And that really helps us to actually guide to the specific nutrient needs of the particular individual. I think, uh, Dr. Sorry, Arjun, sorry. You... yes, sorry. So I'll quickly go on to uh, Do Dr. Gupta as well. And uh, Dr. Gupta, in your clinical practice and dealing with adolescents and children, my, my question is more, more relevant to that. And uh, usually when you have a child who presents with mental health issues, and obviously I'm, I'm sure that obviously the children are accompanied with their family and, and in the Indian setup, perhaps their grandparents and the entire joint family comes with the child. Everyone is very, very troubled and anxious. What is your usually your first line of management? And with a child, obviously giving too much medication is also definitely not on, on the top priority. Is it that you start with diet or you start with a good balance of diet and medication or that maybe you could also wean off the medication with diet? And um, and if you could talk about this and also tell us a little bit about the great work, sir, that you've done in the field of autism and any connections with that. Thank you. Yeah, multiple questions. Let me ask one. See, um, whenever a family comes to me, they're not open for medication. A lot of times. And a lot of times, uh, they, they, they don't want the medication to be able to put up for a seven, eight-year-old or a 12-year-old or 16-year-old. They're not open for it. They want something and they know that in my practice, I'm the last one to start medication. So they're quite, they are quite they, they know that my profile is to focus on the diets and supplements. Second point, I need to assess what is severity of depression or anxiety. If it is mild anxiety, mild depression, I never think of medication. If it is moderate to severe or the timing is that just before the exam, something is very critical happening, then then I think for medication, otherwise for mild or mild to moderate cases where I can have time, I can buy time, I can enroll the parents, grandparents, can we wait and work on it? I usually start with the diet, supplements and therapy, psychotherapy. This is my first thing. And in a lot of mild cases, I'm able to get success with supplements, uh, supplements, diet and the thing. 
a lot of these things i don't i don't go to gluten free uh, because a lot of time when i tell them they are not very open for it especially the teenagers they are not very open for it but i try to cut down the refined products refined refined flour i try to cut down the sugar high calorie stuff i try to cut down the processed packaged preservative food i try to cut down what cut down the the drinks with their on i try to put their sleeping pattern on time i try to introduce the exercise so that whatever way as dr tom was saying we can reduce the inflammation that's a gist correct youngsters are not not so much open for the rainbow diet they don't they don't they don't want you know to try those seasonal fruits and vegetables the indian ones they have their own thing but yes gradually i try to introduce to them and yes so some of the mild mild cases who follow the diet along with the liver therapy i see good results that's where coming to moderate to severe who comes to me who are on multiple medication yes i try to titrate them and try to bring down from multiple medication to at least one or two medication so that the side effect profile can reduce and wherever possible i try to introduce supplements i'm known i'm known in the my field to add lot of supplements yes i do write lot of supplements if they're open for investigation i add investigation if they're not open for investigation i do write supplements and and especially like uh, magnesium especially omega 3 especially like l-theanine so these are my, my favorite ones uh, sometimes ashwagandha if they're open for it as a, as a soothing agent as a calming agent if they're open for it now coming to my autism work because my gluten free my gluten free work and mostly my diet work is related to autism yes i'm one of the biggest fan when i get one and a half year old two year olds four year old and anything if they are if they got issues i strongly emphasize if they don't have gut issues then also emphasize to start with the diet because i totally believe any intervention should start with the gut in that profile of children when they follow strictly diligently diet let me tell you arjun i see very very highly promising results especially when they do it at early age and then gradually top up with the supplement as required so i totally believe that brain the gut is a second brain during my training whenever i got training in my autism biomedical work from us other people i totally believe that unless you don't heal gut you can't get success whether it's autism neurodevelopment disorders including adhd or even mental health disorders so you need to heal, heal gut to get success and that's what is my mantra thank you thank you dr gupta that is indeed very interesting and uh, we'll definitely chat about this offline so quickly before i go to the other panelists dr shukla actually had a prior commitment so my last question to him would be that sir all of us are aware about your long journey in the allopathic field and heading hospitals like artmis and max and now we see that you're very focused into this holistic way of treating people and chronic illnesses and what is integrative medicine and what is that integrative approach and how come this metamorphosis or how come you thought of adding this speciality or a multitude of specialities when it came to curing someone of a disease uh yes arjun uh, even though i am a conventional hardcore allopathic physician for last 30 years you are right uh, you, we are the pioneers you know we are the first ones to set up the integrative medicine center in india prana center for integrative medicine uh my co-founder dr ashima herself is a psychologist and has been working on holistic approach to address chronic diseases and mental health issues through the gut health for last um, about a decade and we work by integrating the conventional system of medicine nutrition and traditional medicine and we have uh, successfully treated uh, uh, many patients with chronic illness and mental health with very good patient outcomes uh even though you know i am aware of the limitations of the allopathic system of medicine but i am also proud of the technological advances and innovations and uh, in my search to offer more to my patients we launched this prana center for integrative medicine uh, because i believe that integrative medicine is all about changing our focus you know to one of health and healing rather than just relief of symptoms from the disease Uh, basically it involves a deeper understanding of the influences of our mind spirit beliefs cultural systems lifestyles on the causation of diseases and at prana we believe in evidence based personalized care and we focus on the whole person and all the unique characteristics of the individual person to create 
customized healing for their physical, mental, emotional, and social and spiritual well-being. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for that, sir. And we'll definitely remember those pearls of wisdom. And uh, I think curing a disease from all directions is very important if you have to cure it from the root itself. So quickly moving on to Dr. Divya also and then Dr. Bhavna. So Dr. Divya, I'm very curious to understand. So uh, whenever, whenever there is a patient who comes to you, and then obviously nutrition and diet being a very key aspect of how you're counseling them or the therapy that you're suggesting. Could you share with us a few examples or perhaps any combination of different diets that you have seen are more effective or is it more specific for the kind of issue that, that you are dealing with? And also a lot of people coming in, I'm sure they are on certain medication. So has diet helped you wean them off those medications? Anything related to this field, we'd love to hear. Yeah. So I think when I work with clients, it's like we've been talking about, it's that integrative approach, which starts with whatever you put in your mouth has an impact on your body, both mind and uh, physically as well. So I think it starts off with, of course, you want to build a good therapeutic relationship with the client where they start trusting you, that rapport is built, where you know they're looking at you for uh, all the suggestions you're making and for building their motivation to um, get more active, to uh, focus on eating. Like I said, a, a host, I always explore emotional eating and that becomes a nice segue into kind of uh, working with the um, people to start looking at what they're eating and how they can uh, start substituting healthier options uh, and things like that. Of course, uh, like Dr. Gupta mentioned, that if somebody is coming in with moderate to severe depression or anxiety, especially when there's any indication of self-harm and there's a lot of suicidality, they're clearly on medication. So I'm not very quick to jump in to say, you know what, no, no, let's look at other options. But maybe think about, okay, let's start working uh, across the board in terms of identifying what your stressors are, how do you deal with them, uh, getting the family on board if there is any family intervention uh, that's needed as well. Um, you So then, of course, and then, like I said, movement, uh, what physical activity they're doing, um, how are they living life on an everyday basis, what they're eating. I've noticed that when all of these dimensions, and it's very difficult to tease out what is contributing to what, but clearly... Um, you know, uh, I feel the biggest jump I've seen is when nutrition is is changed. They come up with reports like I'm feeling so much better mood wise or my energy levels are so high that I'm able to engage with life a lot better. Uh, so I feel in cases that come with anything, I mean, I work primarily with depression, anxiety and stress management. So for me, I've seen clear indications that when you work across the board, when making these lifestyle suggestions, um, it in a way uh, starts impacting uh, kind of uh, across all domains. And then notice like Ishi also suggested, the medicines start weaning off. It becomes more of a, how do I manage my lifestyle now and take it in my charge and my control so that I'm not reliant on medications and things like that. So that's where the shift in a way happens towards more of a positive growth in, in that sense. I hope that answers your question, Dr. Dan. Yes, yes. Very interesting, Dr. Divya. So, Dr. Bhavna, similar question to you. And uh, any any other viewpoints, anecdotes, or case studies would be really interesting. And any interesting nutritional interventions that you've done in your set of patients. And also, if there are certain challenges, although you did discuss it, anything else that we missed out? Yeah, I think it's been all very all encompassing. And like I was saying that um, I became more cognizant the moment this beautiful topic emerged. And just in the last 15 days, as many of my clients who came, especially with anxiety and depression, I actually asked them to follow. I said, I would like you to do this for your own self. As the gut brain access is becoming very, very prominent now, I did this with a very small sample of about 10 people. And I was so happy with my own self because when the feedback came in and I said that I just want you to go on a gluten-free diet for the first 10 days. And after that, if you feel that it is benefiting and changing about not only your mood and your thought process, but an overall state of happiness. 
because I also run these happiness studios in different parts of the NCR. And the concept came from there. And I said, even if it is not, because it was a challenge to tell them that it will correlate with the reduction in your anxiety or your depression. I said, let's work at the happiness quotient. Just do it for 10 days, after which they usually come back for their appointments. And nine out of 10 of those clients came back saying that, yes, our well-being quotient is at a higher level. And that's the time I texted. And I said, you know, bang on. And I was feeling so happy that I personally went myself on a gluten-free diet for the last 10 days to just see the exuberation. Does it actually come back? And it was and it was actually very, very highly correlated. So I would say that even if I don't get into those nine out of 10 case studies here, but if we take five and five, or all of them were depression and anxiety, and nine is a very, very good feat to say that the gut brain access, and just, I, I only worked on eliminating gluten for the moment. And that itself got a remarkable result. Yet, I would like to say that this 10 was out of the 100 that followed what I asked them to do. So if I saw 100 people in a week, out of them, 10 consented to be a part of this small group study that I wanted to do subjectively for my own self and bring to the surface today. So visibly, what I'm trying to say is that 10% of our clientele in psychotherapy agree to get into nutritional psychology. The other 90s, Still, we are at a challenging board of trying to get it. Because the other thing is, I appreciate to Dr. Um, I think Dr. Gupta was mentioning that he prefers an integrated approach over an allopathic approach. And I really liked what he said, that people are also becoming amenable to that. Because working in a tertiary care hospital for the last 25 years, our attitude of Indians is very, very medically oriented. So the challenge is also to enable them to wean off medications and come to psychotherapy, which is the first challenge. And then along with psychotherapy to wean off that same medication and become on a nutrition path. So though I would say that out of 100 clients, 10 consented to be a part of the small group study, subjective results were brilliant. I think as a team, I would really like to work towards creating the state of well-being. And of course, we did, we did anxiety, anxiety and depression tests. So it was not just subjective vocalizations. There was objective evidence via psychometric assessment on two of the scales, which are internationally standardized. So I was truly very, very uh, happy to get results. And also the results so quick. Because even if I look at myself doing psychotherapy, I don't get such a difference in a objective screening of depression and anxiety in from one session to the next as well. So I was very, very happy that we are all becoming so cognizant of this approach now. I and I definitely am going to follow this through. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bhavna. That was very interesting. Sorry, moving on to issue, ma'am. So could you tell us a little bit more, um, Dr. Gupta and Dr. Shukla spoke a little bit about it, but maybe you can also put some uh, thoughts into that regarding the supplements. So there's a lot of uh, talk about omega-3s also, even ashwagandha as a stress reliever, etc. But do you think there are some supplements that you would advise as a generic advice to our viewers today that can help uh, with preventing and also if there are any prevailing mental health disorders that you would recommend? And also, obviously, all supplements are recommended in their FDA approved or your daily amount that is uh, that is recommended a little bit about that also, ma'am. And also any other uh, case studies that you'd like to share on today's topic. Yeah. So as we were talking, I just, um, was, you know, the gut brain axis, I was reminded of a very old saying in India, which says, Jesa an, Vesa man which I guess our ancestors, obviously that means had fixed and had figured now scientifically discovery. Jaisa uh, Anvesa Man for the audience which does not understand Hindi is basically the way what the grain you eat will determine your mind. And uh, Aham Anam is another one which says the same thing, which from the Upanishads. 
So yes, uh, I think we are all beginning to uh, accept the connections of uh, what we eat, the um, the effect of the and uh, our mood and the gut is not functioning optimally. Uh, the word is what we call uh, the leaky gut. Um, there is a malabsorption of nutrients first. So we need to replenish the levels of the uh, nutrients which are you know, below optimum levels and then also use those nutrients and other nutrients uh, which we now know are associated um, to optimize them and use them as therapy, as therapeutic levels. So one is getting them up to at least the normal levels and then to use certain uh, nutrients to, um, you know, as therapeutic, uh, do with the therapeutic doses. And uh, the ones which we uh, normally work with um, are uh, vitamin D, uh, magnesium and uh, when we give magnesium we also need to give calcium uh, some amount of zinc and vitamin b12 and certain other vitamins uh, biotin and uh, vitamin b6 uh, selenium so there is a whole lot but anybody who uh, just picks up these nutrients i mean these vitamin pills on their own should uh, not do that B vitamins are the safest ones, but they need to be done uh, under supervision. And some of the deficiencies can be documented through blood work, but some uh, may not. And uh, one more thing uh, must be said is that often when we have a damaged or uh, issues with the gut, it will also be uh, anemic and have iron deficiency. So even that needs to be uh, corrected. Uh, besides that, we have what we call the omega-3 fats, also called the brain fats, which, um, which are needed and uh, optimum not uh, seen very often. So we need to correct those with supplements and uh, giving, uh, you know, sometimes fish oils are a problem with certain patients in India because of the vegetarian or vegan, uh, you know, kind of choices people make. So we need to give plant versions of that. And uh, truly, if these are, you know, in my practice, I find uh, pretty, you know, very powerful uh, impact. And um, then, of course, because we're talking about the microbiome, giving uh, a good cocktail of probiotics uh, in therapeutic, uh, you know, gut, et cetera, and uh, sometimes through foods and fermented foods, et cetera, are also important. And um, then generally figuring, you know, the digestion, we need to figure, uh, you know, give them digestive support. So we have many spices and combinations in India. And uh, somebody mentioned ashwagandha, Dr. Gupta mentioned, and uh, also, you know, things are very similar to that can help, uh, you know, uh, fixing these problems, but they have to be done uh, in a case-to-case -case basis. And therefore the diet really is uh, about being customized and tailor-made to each individual. So, yeah, I, I just uh, want to say that. And, uh, you know, like I said, this, this the, you know, patient, the last patient I saw today is somebody who has been battling, um, you know, obesity, diabetes, liver disease for many years with me. And over the last, I would say, 15 years, he's been with me. And we, uh, we decided to go gluten-free with him about uh, five to six years ago. And he's been very, very sincere uh, because he knows he has, he's on the edge. He's a 50 plus uh, young man and um, doing very well travels and in the food business uh, also. So understands this very well. But he said, I'll comply to everything. But if I go to Dubai, I have to have my beer. And um, so I just smiled and I said, OK, uh, by the way, beer has, you know, is not a very, uh, very it, it, the gluten content of beer is very, very mild. And some beers can claim to be gluten free because they they comply to the 20 parts, less than 20 parts per million. So he um, he just said, I said, so um, Sumit, so you didn't have a problem. And uh, he said, nothing happened to my stomach. So I said, OK, that's wonderful. And he's had many, many beers. And then um, under his breath, he said, but I, my, I, my, I was messed up in my head. I said, come again. 
So he says, yeah, I was totally messed up in my head and I had, I got such a panic attack and I was so anxious. I took a flight back and came back to Delhi. I said, pause, tell me when did this happen? Post the beer. He says, yeah, just two days after the beer. So, you know, nothing happened to his gut. So he felt he was fine. But then he came up with this. I said, so then what do you want to say? He says, how could it have anything to do with it? I said, well, it has everything to do with it. And uh, there you go. So I said, you must join the webinar today. And I don't know whether he's there, but this is how, you know, how um, accurate the science is. It just does, it, it's painfully accurate. Great. So That's yes, very the, message, the message that I'm trying to say is that our gut microbiome is very smart, is very sensitive, and it'll let you know that it's disturbed. So we need to listen to our bodies and listen to these little creatures living inside us. And if we respect them, uh, I think we we do service to ourselves, both in physical health and in mental health. I think, ma'am, that's 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 very important, and uh, this is this is a very interesting story, especially two days after him having the beer and when he took the flight back. That's very interesting indeed. Also, very interesting to know that there is gluten-free beer available. I think we, we need to find out more about that. So quickly going on to Dr. Tom as well. And uh, Dr. Tom, you were wanting to share your screen and uh, I think now uh, you are able to share it. So please go ahead. Yes, thank you so much. Um, uh, before I do, I just wanna say that what um, Ishi Kolsa just said is very important for the overall picture of uh, brain health and brain function. There are many different nutrients that our brains need, our bodies need. There are many. And you learn over time about all of them. You know, one may be really important, a magnesium deficiency or a B12 deficiency may make a world of difference. But in general, in general, you get the most bang for your buck. You get the most benefit by considering this topic of wheat sensitivity and gluten sensitivity that the results can be quick and dramatic. Uh, but all of the other nutrition is very important. Uh, but our talk today about wheat, I just want to put in perspective, you know, if you're going to start somewhere, you don't keep doing the same lifestyle and take some fish oil and expect the big difference, right? You know, so the biggest effect usually will be by the foods that you eat. And wheat is a major, major contributor to brain dysfunction. And from that perspective, I'm going to show you a, a, a study now that keeps it, that is pretty shocking to see. Um, this was a 14-year-old girl who came to these doctors after um, her history of being diagnosed with uh, psychosis. Uh, and uh, they, the doctor started off their medical paper by saying non-celiac gluten sensitivity. So this isn't even a celiac patient, but she had a sensitivity to wheat. And a 14 year old girl came to their clinic for psychotic symptoms, apparently associated with gluten. In May of 2012, after a fever, she became increasingly irritable and reported daily headaches and concentration difficulties. One month after this, her symptoms were worse, presenting with severe headaches, sleep problems, behavior alterations, and several unmotivated crying spells and apathy. And her parents are wondering, what's wrong with our little girl? Her school performance deteriorated. She was an excellent student, uh, but her teacher said her school performance was deteriorating. Her mother noticed that she had bad breath for the first time ever. The patient was referred to a local neuropsychiatric outpatient clinic where they diagnosed her with a conversion somatic We seem to have lost Dr. Tom for a minute, I think. Yes, that's right. Um, I think we can wait for a minute, Arjun. 
Sure. Let's just wait because this is a very interesting case study that he's come up with and uh, wouldn't want to make the audience miss out on it. Dr. Dang, I believe uh, we lost the network connection with uh, Dr. Tom O'Brien in the US. Yes, I think I think unfortunate, but uh, it seemed like a very interesting uh, case study that he was going to tell us about. Um, I, I don't think we have any other options, but uh, to go to the other panelists until he returns. And uh, anything uh, with uh, Ishi Ma'am or anyone else who wants to uh, make a comment before we close, yeah, I just like to um, take it from uh, when Dr. Gupta mentioned that uh, he does nutrition therapy for autistic children. And um, I want the audience to know that the diet for autistic children is very, very clearly defined as a gluten-free, casein-free diet. It's called a GFCF diet. And uh, that means association between the microbiome and the you know, neurodevelopmental disorder is very clear. And once you do that, and in my clinical practice, I come, I have patients who come with autism and who are on medication. They still continue to have symptoms and uh, initiating this diet comes with really magical results. And uh, casein is the, uh, is the milk protein. It's called, um, you know, casein. Uh, and it's not about dairy and lactose. It's about milk protein. So a lot of people miss uh, interpret uh, this as um, you know lactose free diet it's not lactose free the, the, the milk is combination of sugar which is lactose and protein which is casein one of the proteins so uh, it's that protein is what we are trying to uh, work at and uh, so otherwise lactose free could also include curd etc which are also sources of casein so it is complete uh, almost elimination of dairy in all its forms, and um, also, um, you know, gluten and some other grains, which include corn, soya, oats, etc. And, um, you know, the, the, the results are absolutely, uh, you know, dramatic. And like we said, very quick, it's not doesn't take a while. Um, and uh, so I think the connections between what we eat, and um, what we don't eat, are getting more and more clear. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I think uh, we've all understood regarding the connection between the gut and the brain through this session today. And uh, the only connection that I can't wrap my head around is uh, that of Dr. Tom's with the internet right now. <laughs> and usually his internet is seamless. But I think it's been very enlightening. And, and thank you, everybody, for taking the time. And a big thanks to Dr. Divya and Dr. Bhavna also, who were the subject matter experts. And Dr. Gupta, who had to leave early. Dr. Shukla for always being so insightful and obviously she ma'am and then uh, back to you Arjun thank you everybody and a big, uh, big thank you to you Dr. Dang uh, you. you know it's not easy to navigate a panel of such esteemed panelists and uh, get all that you need out of them I know that you know this is one and a half hours is not enough to get this topic detailed and done in through but uh, I think it's a good start and uh, thank you ladies and gentlemen and Ishi, ma'am, we need to connect on that name of the beard now. Uh, I certainly will do. I think there is a question in the chat box. Uh, would you like to take it, Arjun? Sure, sure. I'm just checking it. Um, so is curd a pro? Yeah, is curd a probiotic? The open one? So one? it's related to autism. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just an answered it with the GF and CF diet. And I think Dr. Gupta could add more to it. But yes. unfortunately, and we are going to have a full session, a uh, full on autism. on autism. So we'll do Absolutely. That. Absolutely. So, Karthik, thanks for asking that question. And uh, Arjun from our team will keep you posted whenever we have that uh, uh, seminar. And we'll discuss specifically about autism and hope to answer this question then. Thank you. Thank you. Me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Good Thank night. you all. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank Bye. You. Bye.